What? Lonely, I'm right here. You want a red friend? I'm sorry I'm not communist enough for you. Literally red. How can I do that? I only have one skin. You're talking about a new car, aren't you? You want a new car friend? Okay, just so we're on the same page, do you want this new car friend to be the color red or from a communist country? Both. I've bought a 1991 Lada 2107 and the Trabant is very happy about it. The story of Lada begins. The story of Lada begins back in 1970 in Soviet-era Russia at the Vaz factory with the start of production of the 2101, a reworked for the Soviet Union Fiat 124, a car that itself had started production four years earlier in 1966. This is not a 2101. This model began production in 1980, and it is nothing like the 2101. In the same way, gasoline is nothing like petrol. This is the Vaz 2107, or Lada 2107, or Lada Riva, or in Canada, Dennis. Really, for a short time there was a Canadian importer that was calling these the Dennis Signet. And the Neva? That was the Dennis 4x4. Dennis. Anyway. Mine, as I already said, is a 91, which means it was built in the Avtovaz factory in what would only be the Soviet Union for a couple of months after this thing was built. After that, it was just boring old Russia again. But this model didn't outlive the Soviet Union by just a couple of months. Although its production moves factories several times, this model, as you see it here, remained in production until 2012. The last factory was in Egypt. Although that's an impressively long run, the Western world had lost interest long before this point. Lada officially pulled out of the UK, and from what I can tell, most Western countries, by 97. Even though it was one of the cheapest new cars available, a car in 97 with no Airbags, ABS, fuel injection, power steering, style. Not all that appealing three years away from the new millennium. Even if it did cost five pounds, three ounces. Or however British money works. Okay, so it was a little outdated, but that's just my decadent Western point of view speaking. If you lived in Soviet-era Hungary, for example, this was one of, if not the nicest car you could own. Now to you and me, this may not scream luxury car, but everything's relative. Let's compare this to another popular car from Soviet-era Hungary. The Trabant. Yes, these little sinkers were very popular in Soviet-era Hungary, as was the Polski Fiat. But I don't have one of those. I should get one. By the way, if you're wondering why I'm so focused on Hungary, that's where this and my Lada are from. In comparison to the Trabant, Rolls-Royce. The Trabant has two cylinders. This has four. This engine is two-stroke. Four-stroke. The oil stays in the engine. Two doors. Four doors! Two seat belts for four seats. Really? Four seat belts! It's actually five, I lied. 26 horsepower. Four, sorry, 75 horsepower. I think? Thereabouts. These body panels are made of cotton. Etos Delani Stali. Lada Smiechina Tvoy Mashinis Perovoitinik Stanov. So sorry to everyone that speaks Russian. Really, this can all be summed up by saying the Lada is a real car. This, as I already mentioned, is the Lada 2107, but there was also the Lada 2105. It followed pretty much the same production history as this car, but the differences between this and that are vast and comprehensive. The lovely people I bought this car from also had in their inventory a 94 2105, also in red. The 2107 has a big chrome grille. The 2105 does not. This car has a tachometer. The 2105 does not. This has headrests. The 2105 also has headrests. Yeah, they're the same car, but with slightly different interiors and a different grill. You can sort of think of this as the deluxe version, but that's a bit like calling your mac and cheese gourmet because you sprinkled parsley on it. These two examples even had the same engine and transmission. Although that 2105 had headlight wipers, mine doesn't, and that makes me sad. The engine I have is the Vaz 2103 which is confusing because that's also the name of a whole car. Imagine if Toyota came out with a new sedan called the 2JZ. As so proudly displayed by this badge right here, the engine in this car is a 1.5 liter with a single barrel carburetor, a manual choke, and a catalytic converter, which I'm sure works wonders paired with a carburetor. This engine makes 75 horsepower, I think. Again, because the engine has the same name as a whole car, 
difficult to nail down specific information. I've been led to believe by everyone that this engine and all of its relatives are basically bulletproof and last forever. However, everyone also says the Trabant could be fixed with three wrenches and a hammer. But the very first thing I tried to do to it required a specialty tool that was only made for the Trabant that I had to order from East Germany. So I don't believe everyone anymore. A 1.5 wasn't your only option though. You could also have a 1.2, a 1.3, a 1.6, a 1.7, or if you're the KGB, a two rotor Wankel engine with 140 horsepower. I didn't know that existed in a Lada before making this video. I want a Wankel Lada. It has a very conventional layout, front engine, rear wheel drive, live rear axle with a manual transmission, and a manual transmission was your only option. I think. I saw a Dennis brochure that said automatic was available, so maybe not. You could have that manual as either a 4 or a 5 speed, and the 5 speed is definitely the one you want. As I said earlier, when I went to pick up this car, I had the choice between this or a nearly identical 2105. I picked this because this one has the 5 speed. As the seller told me, you definitely want that fifth gear if you're going to spend any time on the highway. And he was right. The only problem is this isn't a 5 speed car, it's a 4 speed. The seller's gone through so many Ladas that he had this car confused with another Lada that he did have that actually had a five speed. And I wasn't paying enough attention to notice. When I got home and realized this gear shift can't count to five, I told him and he was so embarrassed and ashamed that he offered to import a five speed transmission for me at no cost. Although I turned him down because I didn't pay attention either and nobody was really at fault. We both just made a mistake. Now, would a fifth gear be nice? Yeah, I'm doing 110 kilometers an hour, so about 65 miles an hour, and I'm pulling 4,000 revs, and this is just what it's like on the highway. And to make matters worse, there's a little dot right there at about 108 kilometers an hour, indicating that I should shift into a fifth gear that I don't have. At least I assume that's a shift point. There's also dots all over the tachometer. And if those are shift points, why are there six of them past red line? There's even one up there past 8,000 RPM. What are these dots for? Yeah, initially I didn't care about the lack of a fifth gear, but it's pretty buzzy without it. Maybe I will ask that guy to import a five speed after all. As I understand it, the two transmissions are the same, have the same ratios, but the five speed has an extra gear on top. So what do you say? Would you like to see me five speed swap this Lada? Aside from buzzy McBuzzerton up there, how does this thing drive? Well, Lada's logo is a sailboat, and that pretty well describes how this thing drives. I didn't time that very well. It's relatively soft and comfortable. You hear the bumps, but you don't feel them much. The steering is not rack and pinion, it's a steering box, so while I wouldn't say there's play in it as such, it's about as communicative as someone who is emotionally unavailable. The shifter is vague, although not as bad as the shifter in a Yugo, which isn't saying much. Clutch, vague. Brake pedal, more vague. The top 90% of the brake pedal does nothing, and the last 10% does everything at different rates every time. All this adds up to a car that is very difficult to drive smoothly and can in no way be considered sporty, although it's not really trying to be a sporty car. I will say this, though. Of my slow, silly cars, this is the least underpowered. There's a hill on this highway, and when I go up that hill, I don't slow down much. As with any older car, I'm never sure if these are characteristics of just my car or all Ladas. Maybe other Ladas have better brake pedal feel. Maybe they're all worse. Given the huge number of Ladas in semi-rural Missouri, I'll never know. But what I do know is this example I have here is in fantastic shape, but crucially, it's not so perfect that I'm afraid to use it, which would be silly for a Lada. For instance, it has been repainted or at least touch-up painted at some point in its past, and it has very little rust, but it's not completely rust-free, as I found out when I went to put this thing on my lift. One of the jack points completely crumbled. P.O.R.? not structural. Someone has restored this engine bay. This is the most spotless engine bay of anything I own, and it's in a lot of. There's no leaks, there's no mechanical problems of any kind, except for this wheel bearing appears to be going out, and it runs a little bit on the rich side. That could probably be fixed with a little bit of carburetor tuning, but I'm not gonna do that, because you know what you do with a carburetor that's not causing any major issues? You leave it alone. Welcome to the interior of the Lada, where there are four seats, I feel like I should point out these door cards because look at this material. 
And then look at the material under the bonnet. Is this the same material, just with more grease on it? Because it looks like it. Look at all the gauges I have. That's the other little issue with these cars. These small gauges, they're problematic. This Econ gauge doesn't work. And first of all, if it did work, the color scheme doesn't make any sense. It goes from red to green to yellow. That's not the order I would expect those colors to go in. The cooling gauge either works or causes a panic attack. The fuel gauge likes to bounce. The voltage gauge, you know what, that seems to work, so that's good. Here's the center stack. The radio is obviously not factory and I've disconnected it. Why would you listen to music when you have a buzzing four cylinder to listen to? There's a small row of buttons down here that do various things, your shifter, and the climate controls are pretty self-explanatory. There's definitely something wrong with my heater, maybe a duct not hooked up somewhere. And I say that because it's pathetic, it blows warm air out of the defroster vents, but no matter what I change, it blows cold air out of these vents that are blowing at my face. And I assume there's something wrong with it because I refuse to believe that a car made for Siberia has this pathetic of a heater. Here's the lot of steering wheel with the sailboat logo. The column stocks are exactly what you'll find in a Yugo because they're Fiat parts, although in here they're black instead of yellow brown. And just like a Porsche, the key is on the left side of the steering column. Also, glove box. See the number etched on all the windows? That was the original number plate that was on the car. It was for anti-theft or whatever. Do you think that they etched it with the window rolled down to this level? Because if you roll it up, it's no longer at the same height as all the others. Welcome to the trunk of the Lada. It's quite roomy in here. Not comfortable, roomy. This trunk is also home to the spare tire and the tool kit. Now, I'm not going to make any wild claims about this car's ease of serviceability because I haven't done much to it yet, but I will point out one thing I noticed. The front ball joints are not pressed in. They're bolted in, which will make them much easier to service, which you'll inevitably have to do more often if you spend a lot of time on the poorly taken care of roads of Russia or Oklahoma. I'm sure you already realized this, but just in case you didn't, this is a very basic car. It doesn't have power locks, power steering, power windows, power mirrors power. It doesn't even have door detents. They just swing freely. In fact, this car is so basic. Here's a couple of features it has that legitimately impressed me. There's an indicator light on the dash to let you know when your choke is pulled out. I've never seen that before. Probably because everything else, especially by the 90s, either had an automatic choke or fuel injection, but that's helpful. And if you pull up on the parking brake, there isn't just a light. There's a light that comes on and then starts flashing, and it flashes silently. So you know what that means? There's a computer in here. One thing I've heard before about Ladas is, oh, they're built like tanks. No, I put this thing on my lift, jacked up evenly from all four corners, and the sheer stress of that was enough to warp the body so much, the doors got stuck. It's not a tank, it's a wet noodle. But you probably could have guessed that if you looked at the A-pillars, which are thinner than my wrist. I have a problem with the Lada. It's a car. My other weirdos, Robin, Trabant, Wego, when it worked, are so absurd, they're hard to even classify as cars. This is definitely a car, just not a very good one. The way it drives is sloppy. It's not particularly comfortable. It's loud, but it's also not hilariously bad. It's just bad in the normal way. That's my problem with this car. It's not bad enough to be entertaining, but it's also not good enough to be entertaining or to be a good, useful car. It's somewhere in between. The thing that makes this car interesting is just the fact that it's a Lada in America. And history doesn't make a car fun to drive. I don't know if I'm going to keep this car a super long time. I'm glad I bought it in the first place and I'm glad I've had the time to experience it, but I don't know that it has a spot in my fleet for the long term. By the way, are you wondering how much I paid for this car? It's too much for a Lada. This is now the most expensive used car I've ever bought and it's a lot of $9,500. I think there's something wrong with me. And that's my Lada. What do you think? Should I keep it, maybe five speed swap it and see if my attitude changes, or just go ahead and sell it and get something else that I want a little bit more? I've always wanted a Polsky Fiat, for example, or maybe I could get something French this time, a Citroen GS perhaps. Maybe I could go really high end and get a CX. I don't know. All I know for sure is that I'll do something.